Hey everyone and welcome to Almost Cancelled, I'm Peter, that is Connor, and we are going to talk about Too Old to Die Young, Volume 3, The Hermit. So full spoilers for the episode, as always. Nailed that title that time, didn't, didn't, didn't you know? Just a little bit of hesitation, no, better than last time though. I did not follow that, that was, that was a pitch perfect reading of the title. Uh huh. So yeah, full spoilers for the episode. Um, So we come back to LA in this episode. And we, what's funny about this is that for a lot of the episode, despite the fact that we're back with Martin, so much of this episode revolves around new characters again, that it still kind of felt like, oh, we're mostly learning about new people again, even though Martin's still a major factor in this one. It's tangentially told through him. Yes. But it's all this new story, mainly. Yeah, because we, we, because we don't start with him, we start with this extended sequence um, the actual inner cuts between two things and it shows that the two characters connected um, it's not outright said but it's heavily implied because of the way it intercuts that the speech that Jenna Malone's character uh, Diana is giving to this couple uh, and you know she comes across as being like a some sort of like new agey therapist like self help like she's she's going on Hippie about dippy bullshit is, is the commonly referred to phrase you know she was talking about the placement of the sun and shite <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. And she's talking about what this couple's been through, uh, and like they, they do need something valuable from them. Although notably, and this is relevant later, I think, when they're looking into uh, you know the hiring of a potential hitman, is that there's no money that changes hand. They you know they give her like earrings that are valuable as opposed yeah. to anything else. But this is intercut with footage of John Hawk's character, who I actually forgot was going to be in this until. Uh, yeah, me too until like not not when i watched this episode i think it was when i was looking at the cast list for episode one his name popped up and i went oh he's going to be i forgot he was going to be in this uh see i never looked at the cast list i've always got it up when we're <laughs> we're talking yeah, yeah i know you do but i have to have a dark screen here otherwise it's blinding mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh so and he's missing an eye so the the opening shot of him is very kind of surreal because he's he's there's like a hole his eye sockets yeah, just kind of just... putting in the you know the glass eye yeah um, but he, you know, he's following this guy, and it it becomes quite clear when when they mention a like a a, a sexual assault of some kind in it, because I, I don't think that they get as specific to mention it was a, on a child in the opening scene. I don't remember realizing or, or getting that information until a little bit later. But when they mention someone who is, you know, like, because I think she says something along the lines of uh, after what he did to you. And I immediately, yeah. okay, this sounds like someone who's who's raped someone. Um, and it wasn't until later we found out it was their son that was the victim. But we get this this guy who's, you know, again, it's implied just from the, the way it's cutting back and forth that this is the guy. that we're, This guy's coming back with his shopping and he's pulling it out. Uh, and that's when John Hawk strikes. You know, that's when Vigo, his character, strikes and takes him out. And then from there we, we follow him. He puts the body in the back of this car. Uh, we find out later, of course, this car was stolen. It's not his car, which is honestly a smart move. You don't want caught for murder. <laughs> it built your own car. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good idea. Um, yeah. But it didn't have a full tank. He runs out of fuel uh, on his way to wherever he's going to dispose of the body, and he has to like pull into like a little alleyway uh, as, as he's, as, you know, it's just digging at him. It's like, running on empty. He's, he's looking around for. Kind of like this. This is as good as it gets. Yeah. Uh, and then he has a bit of a oopsie moment, I'll call it. <laughs> he has an oopsie daisy moment. One way of putting it, yeah. He locks himself out of the car. And what I love about this, again, this is like reference style, the, the just how long and drawn out is, you know, we're, we're in the car real time with him, you know, as he's as the fuel's running out and he's having to pull in and then he, you know, he's sitting there, he starts smoking and he gets out and he he looks in the, the the trunk and I think he's looking for like a, like a canister or something to go and get some gas or, or you know I think that's what he's looking for underneath the body he's kind of rummaging around and then he ends up getting out the car again and then you know the, the shot actually it gives us you know very really does ref and do a close up to make a point specifically but he does it here to show us the keys are in the ignition so then the door shuts and then he can't get back in and he's like well I'm going to break in the window but just as he goes to do that. There's gunshots, and there's just like a couple of thugs killing what looks like a homeless person, just like you know, in another alleyway in the other side of this little basketball court. And he's he sort of hides and he pulls out his gun, does Vigo, and he's behind the car. And yeah, because he doesn't know exactly what's going on. Yeah, he doesn't know if it's to do with him or if this is a random thing. And as he says later to to Diana, he's like, "I got spooked. 
I just like I, I got scared that like I was about to be caught or something was going to happen and he just had to go um and I think what's interesting to me about this character uh, obviously a lot of this this episode is, is kind of about how there's a there's a correlation between him and Martin in a lot of ways but I think what's interesting to me about this character is that he's actually the more noble of the two seemingly um because he oh, never because he never outright says it I mean obviously there's a lot in this episode to make us sympathetic towards him uh we learn that he is dying you know he's going for uh treatment um has he, his mother is uh, very ill as well um yep. dementia um and i mean i'm not i'm going to diagnose her exactly but you know th- that kind of illness yeah and you know he, when he thinks he's going to get caught he's kind of accepting of it he's still he's twitchy about it but he's accepting of it and he, he says to diana like okay we agreed that you know you'll take care of my mother if something happens to me i'll get you the money to do that like you know i'll give you the money back so you can go and put her in a and his home or, or wherever and you know we also see him or, or we also find out that he used to be in the fbi like you know he has a history in law enforcement of some kind absolutely and, yeah uh, that's that's how you know martin's introduced to him is through the print uh, yeah. on the key and it's like okay that's you know why it flags up so quickly because it was it was on the payroll yeah because because dan asked him like how quickly will they find you if they if they find your prints and he's like five seconds and it's because yeah. no he, he he was literally in law enforcement he's on record like it's, it'll immediately come up um and it, this is all interesting and it's, it's all kind of the thing but as it's going on like the dichotomy between him and martin becomes clear because martin's plot in this episode outside of some other stuff earlier on which we'll talk about is eventually um damien does call him in for a job because we don't see like damien and the gang and you know the organized crime at all for most of the episode it's not until quite late on where he gets the call yeah. to come in and he he goes uh he's, he's given a job and it's actually this really weird little scene uh, between him and Damien, where Damien's like, oh, my daughter just got a f- her first phone. She won't sh- stop texting me. And then he says to Martin, like, hey, can you take my photo for a text? He's like, sure. And it's like, the way he says thanks just feels so jovial and like just sort of like normal and every day. As if they're it's not like proper nonchalant, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's actually, I think uh, someone warned us actually about the start of episode three being very lynching in a funny way. And I think the scene that was been referred to is the scene in the police station when the lieutenant's kind of walking around and like you know saying hi to people and then eventually has this conversation with martin but you've got the big fat cop behind him also like talking to like a sex hotline or something I, I, yeah no. I, I, I see that being like side note that uh, in the police station there it all you know more than the detective's office uh ah, same, up with that. Same yeah difference um that was one of the longest scenes i noticed without uh, you know the background sound, so tying into what we were talking about last episode, you know the the safe zone, yeah, where the, it feels the, powerful. The home office, yeah, um, which, yeah, so, so this this scene plays out, and even the way the, the the lieutenant talks to him, felt like a very sort of the the comedy Lynch character to me. The way he talks about rolling the dice and just ah to let Destiny take over, but he's very you nonchalant can see about this it. This being played by Lynch himself, you could if I yell, yeah, you could actually, you could see this being Gordon. From, you can, can I? from Twin Peaks, you totally can. Uh, so that stuck out to me, but uh, the, it's basically yeah, follow the leads and do all that, and you'll know, check their like oh, you know this 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 guy is very quick quick clear very quickly that he's a child molester. So obviously he's a uh, you know a lot of people want to kill him. A lot of people are going to be glad he's dead. So there's a lot of suspects. Yeah. Uh, so check like the families of the you know people that you hurt. Uh, check their bank accounts or their financials. See if they've got any big you know transactions that are over a couple of thousand. You're know, looking for a hitman. And I'm not convinced. Like the, the impression I got uh, from the scene with with Diana and the parents to me didn't tell me that they knew they were hiring a hitman. Like to me that like this seems like something that Diana arranges. But like she she's helping them heal. Uh, but what they don't know is that she's actually arranging for a hitman to go and kill. Them. <laughs> What do they think they're paying for then? Because they're good... obviously think they're paying for something if they're handing over something valuable. You know what? That's a fair point. That is the only hole in my my thing here. But I I just I don't know. I got this weird impression that I don't know if they're actually like intentionally going to hire a hitman here. No, I kind of get it because because she's let's say she's this new age hippy dippy, yeah. you know, coming off all that stuff, and they're kind of playing into that. It feels like they're not really into that side of it. it you know, but. They're clearly aware of some sort of transaction taking place. It's almost like she's selling them on something mystical intervening, but what she's really just doing is getting her, her man Vigo to go and whack him. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, which is interesting, and I, I guess in a weird way, it's it's, it's a way for the, the the parents of the the victim to never be like legally at fault here because they never knew they were doing that. If if she can prove that, if if she can prove that they never flat out came came to her to hire a hitman, then yeah, you know they're in the clear essentially. Um, and pain her and earrings is a good way to get around the record of it as well, obviously. Yeah, de- definitely no big bills in the bank account that way. No. Um, very interesting. But So yeah, the point I was getting at is that so he's Martin's given this job to go and kill uh, some woman. We don't know who she is. We don't know why. We know she lives in a good part of town. That is the one p- piece of information we get to her, get of her, mm-hmm. is that she lives in a nice neighborhood. Martin tries to ask who she is and why she's supposed to die, and he's like, no, nah, don't worry about it. Just, just do it. It's not your concern, yeah. And he's like, what about the alarm? He's like, oh, it's taken care of. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, he's probably telling the truth, but part of me, <laughs> part of me worries. <laughs> part of me worries. I, I think the thing is, he doesn't want man to be caught. Because he wants more jobs done, yeah. Exactly. He wants to use him. You know, getting him caught doesn't help at all. All, all it does is give Martin an, a reason to try and incriminate him. No, nah, true, true. Uh, so... You know, and this is maybe one of the best shot scenes in the the episode. Actually, is is him creeping into the house and just sneaking up behind her when she's like, you know, she's on the the the, the chair, this comfy chair, just sort of sleeping. Reclining chair. Yeah, she's watching TV. She's falling asleep, and he's been giving a syringe. He's like, oh, that's, she'll be out in seven seconds if you give her this. And uh, he comes up and he, he does the deed. Uh, very atmospheric, very well shot. Um, suitably quiet. Uh, like you know it's one of those things where like okay he's wearing big shoes like they'd definitely be making, even on a carpet they'd still be making some amount of yeah but noise. she's an older woman oh, no, 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 no i'm not arguing that she should have heard it because she's asleep i'm arguing that in the sound mix that this is an intentional thing where they've like oh right yeah yeah they've chosen no, to just make it like no dead silent apart from the tv sound yeah yeah i'm with you um i say they've been doing that like that that scene in the police station at the start that that one stood out to me so much because every so often you know you you'd cut to you know the the, the fat cop behind him talking and saying something, mm. but when it wasn't on focus of him, you know when you know the lieutenant's just talking to to Martin, you can still see him moving around and clicking away and talking in the background, but there is no sound whatsoever, and uh, it's so extreme and you know, so it, this is just uh, more of that where this show is really playing with it. Yeah, and that 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 kind is definitely very surreal because you know there's supposed to be noise coming from behind there. Yeah. Um, and there there isn't. But, um, so yeah, what what I'm getting at here is not only I mean we'll get to the scene at the end where he actually talks to uh, Vigo uh, and they actually kind of bring this stuff up. But even at this point in the episode when we see him kill this woman and then he goes into the the other room and just watches her kids. So you know, we, up until this point we didn't even know about this. We just you know he goes into the room and we see these kid these two kids sleeping. And immediately I'm like, this episode has taught me that Vigo hunts bad people. It's taught me that he's kind of a vigilante. He does it for hire, but he's you know he's he's hunting pedophiles and rapists and you know whoever yeah. else. And Martin, by contrast, is doesn't even know who he's killing. He's just been told to kill, and he's doing it. Um, and it it almost made me start thinking about like the characters, and I was wondering if like. Was there a point where, even if he wasn't into like shady stuff with like a, a mob or anything like that, like was there a point for Vigo where he felt that this is what the FBI was making him do? Like he had, he had no say in who he was hunting, he had no say in what he was doing, and th- the reason why he does what he does now is because he wa- he wants to feel like he's actually helping people, Cho- choosing the targets, yeah, kind of you know doing his own research or at least through proxy, uh, yeah, know, right, you know, someone he trusts. Whereas the FBI is just you know you know, you do what you're told. Yeah, and I think this is a very interesting like third party to throw into the mix here in episode three, and you know, obviously we get to this because obviously a lot of the other stuff in the episode is Martin kind of tailing uh, Vigo, Vigo making his preparations, seeing his mum and that, and Martin's kind of like because you know, actually one of my favorite lines of the whole episode is Jenny after because like, we'll talk about this the Jenny stuff with our with our mother's like remembrance whatever, but. She says, can I stay at yours tonight? And he says, yeah, of course. Uh, but I do have something to do in the morning. And so she's like, what? I have to follow a one-eyed man. Oh, yeah, that was a great line. <laughs> yeah, and it was just it was such a good line. It was a good absurd line of dialogue out of nowhere. And she's like, what, is he a pirate? And he's like, I don't know yet. <laughs> but in a weird way, he is kind of like outside the system. Like, he's not playing by the mob rules. He's not playing by the, the cops rules. He's He is kind yeah. of this rebel outside of everything else. Um... 
So uh, that's, that's that's very interesting to me. So he does eventually see him at the end, and even when he was following him early on in the episode, I never got the impression once that Martin had any interest in arresting him. I don't know what he wanted yeah. to do, but it never felt like he was hunting him to arrest him. He didn't have that urgency, did he? No, it was very laid back. It was very relaxed. It was very just watching. It was a c- casual investigation. Like he wanted answers to curiosity rather than, you know, uh, justice. Yeah, I actually, I really liked the shot of uh, it was it was again it was a very silent. Uh, I don't know if they had it on like a steady cam inside the car, but it was like it what didn't have the rockiness to it, but it was like a POV mm. shot from inside the the car. Uh, following yeah. the other car that that was a really nice uh, shot i thought it was nice again very extended very drawn out yeah um so but no so he's like he, he, he kind of like you know ambushes him when he gets out of a motel at the end and he's like hey vigo i know who you are and your know, vigo's like ready to go for his gun he's like i'm not here to arrest you i just want to talk there's a diner around the corner let's go and let's go and chat um Again, very, very. I'd say it's both a twin Peaksy scene but also gives me like the flashbacks of like uh heat uh, of De Niro and Pacino and Heat. <laughs> That's what you mean. The, the, the grimy conversation. Yeah. The, the tense conversation where they're on opposite sides kind of thing. But um, And again, there's like maybe like three or four shots to make up this whole scene uh, as they're sitting there having the conversation. And it's like, okay, I know you killed this guy. Do you only kill Peter Fails? And Vigo's not comfortable enough to just say anything. He's not, he's not going to answer. I, was gonna say, I thought that line was particularly telling uh from mine that that specific question given you know the age of his girlfriend uh mm. there's almost like a little bit of fear in it of okay you know because he, he kind of has this respect for vigo already um but it, there's kind of like this fear of okay would i be a target uh maybe yeah i i i i i don't know if that's a route they're necessarily going to go down hmm I, I get what you're saying with the subtext of him answering, asking that question, but I, I don't know if that's necessarily where we're going with that. Um, no, sorry, yeah, I don't know if he's consciously aware of that, but it felt hmm. very... You know, that was like one of the first things he asked him, and it felt very telling to me. Yeah, because he's aware that he's not supposed to be Data 17. I mean, most people would be, but like he specifically mentioned it in episode one, which is why I'm saying that he, yeah, you know, yeah, he's aware of it. Yeah, the whole thing was hiding around. You know, that, that was the whole point of that. Yeah, um, but he's not really well. And he, but he can't. He opens up. He's like, "Yeah, I killed someone the other night. I do what you do." Uh, but I don't know who she was, and you know, I stared at her kids after I did it, and I felt nothing. And he says, "Is that what it's like for you?" And Vigo says, "No." And it's like, so not only is he picking targets that, at least as a viewer, we're like, "Yeah, we can respect who he's killing <laughs> because of who, who he's killing." It, he also clearly implies here that no, he doesn't feel nothing when he does this. Like he's still he's still a human being. He's not a sociopath. <laughs> Well, I mean, you could choose to read that as he feels some sort of satisfaction from taking them out. Sure, you could. You could. Oh, that's not the impression I necessarily get no, from uh, him. it's not even. It's <laughs> mighty that. I'm just, I just thought I'd present it as you. You yeah. definitely stated it the other way. So I thought I'd just just leave it as open to interpretation. He definitely feels like me, to me like the troubled soul who does what he does because he thinks it's needing to be done. But yeah, it weighs it on feels him. Almost, you know, we've spoken a lot already about uh, redemption, as maybe this will go down that path eventually uh, for the show. It mm. feels like maybe his is the redemption arc. Yeah, I could see so that. For something. We don't know what for yet, but for something. Well, I was wondering, though, like, given that, you know, because we end the scene with. Um... Uh, I think it's Vigo who says first, or, or Martin says to Vigo, do you have to run off somewhere? Um, and he says, "No, nah, I can sit a while." And then Martin's, and he's like, "What about you?" He's like, "No, nah, I've got some time." And they just sit there like together in silence as the, as the episode mm-hmm. ends. It's a really really poignant ending, and they're both in each other's worlds now. And I I do wonder the effect that the Vigo might ha- have on Martin. Like, is is this what starts Martin's like path to something a bit more noble? Can he instill some sense of empathy? Empathy and also some sort of moral code, maybe, or so you know, so something that that leads them down a certain path that. Yeah, something that that makes him want to get out of the mob world. Mm. Uh, you know, have that freedom to do it for himself, Could... even if it's still killing people and you know taking out targets. More like having the the, the freedom to choose, and because he definitely didn't like when he was you know when he asked you know, who is she, and it's you know just told not to worry about it. He definitely didn't like that. 
Yeah, and I, I do wonder if part of like, this feeling nothing is him being coming numb to because you know at the end of episode one it felt like he liked feel like that feeling of power, but we know in this episode that at least uh, three or four months have passed because he mentions that he's been there a few months. So I'm taking that as three or four. Yeah, because obviously we know he only went there at the end of episode one. Yeah, we saw the, the the captain you know tell him that he was going off over there. Fast tracked, I believe, is the uh, the word. Yeah. Um, and so we know it's been a few months and if he's had to do a few hits here because in this episode when he gets this job he never seems to care the fact that he's, care about the fact that he's killing anyone which implies to me that he's done at least a few of them in the time yeah since. It, it didn't feel like a first time he's been called in to do this yeah so I, I do wonder like not only the influence that, that Vigo might have on him but I also kind of look at this and sort of read him as like is he the the kind of the the end of what Martin's story is? Does he represent where he could be in forty years? Mm-hmm. You know, thirty forty years. And pardon me. Yeah. Um. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And uh, you know, like if if as a redemption, if he, you know, if Mark, if V was sorry, is doing what he's doing for redemption, whether it's because he was on a case when he was at the FBI that he, he you know, the, the system, you know, wouldn't let him intervene, and that's what he's fighting for, or was he into shady shit and he he's fighting for redemption just because of things that he's done? Yeah, it either works. Um definitely interested to find out more about his past i'm sure we'll get snippets here or there uh, so same with uh diana like what, what motivated her to do this because she's she's very kind of mysterious and uh it, you know she almost comes across as villainous in some scenes there was the scene where she she gets the money from from vigo to uh you know take care of his mother and martin you know photographs this and he goes to see her her, her office and brings up the photo you do you know this man and um, it kind of questions her, and I, I, I think what I liked about this scene is that she at no point A, seemed worried and B, even though she never flat out said, you know, admitted to what she was doing, there was always this kind of smirk in her face that says, you know exactly you've already kind of figured it out to I'm an extent. I'm just not going to confirm it. But, but it was almost like, I don't really, like, it's almost like she knew that yeah. this person, this cop that's sitting across from the table from her isn't here to just like find the put the perp and arrest them. That there's something more to this, and she's kind of cocky about it almost. Where she's not, no. she's not nervous. No, I agree. I got that sense, you know, that kind of semi villainous feeling of her with um, you know, the the scene with her and Vigo, you know, they're they're walking up and down. And if if we're, yeah, I actually really liked how that was choreographed. That scene. Oh, right? that was, yeah, that was fantastic. There was points where you know he'd stop for whatever reason and you know the camera would keep moving with her you know uh, perfectly framed and then at one point when they came back the other way it'd swap over to following him more yeah but at one point what i really liked is um he 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 fell behind and the camera kept following her to the to the left yeah and, and then, then he walks faster to catch up no 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 no, no. later than that no, no he comes in from the opposite side as if he's walked around the camera because yes. it, it's a yeah. real like whoa what just happened moment because it actually plays with your head a little bit because because yeah, that's the second time it does it you're be, right because he 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 because eventually until it starts moving back in the second half of the scene it's always going from right to left and she's always the camera's always following her and he's always kind of catching up and coming in um from that same side and then eventually after he's fell out of frame again from that side he actually walks in on the other side and it kind of it's this kind of weird moment uh, but you get this sense that they're doing this kind of weird walking dance. But and let's not forget to mention the background of this scene. It is this perfectly still swimming pool. It is like so still. Yeah, and it's just right at the bottom of the frame as well. It's not like mid shot or anything like that. It's really low down. Yeah, so it's just this this perfect kind of flat glisten to to yeah. the bottom of the scene. It's, it's really really beautiful and pretty stuff oh it is yeah and then and like i say then you know after that swerve at the, the other end it, it starts going back the other way and it changes to okay the camera's on him now yeah and i, I think you know going into again this idea of power uh i look at the character of diana and i i wonder like okay this is this is she, she feels cocky in that scene where she's been interviewed and i i, I to me this says that she is now in a place where she feels powerful in what she does and it makes me think that she's a victim of some sort of abuse or she has felt powerless in her past and she is kind of clawed her way to this position yeah. of power and that's why she does what she does with Vigo. Um, Definitely. And I like the insinuation that, you know, that scene with them walking, it, that they're kind of equals because at first it seems like she's, you know, as I said, we're all following her. He's the one catching up and it feels like, okay, no, she's the one in charge. And then, you know, it reverses and it's kind of an equal time going back the other way where, okay, no, now he's the one in control. 
Yeah, I, 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 we've talked about how power, money, and and the treatment of women specifically are the the main themes of this this show. And again, I was feeling this, you know, pretty much throughout. Although it's mm. interesting to me that in this episode, the money is a very different thing. Because in this episode, the money is to save his mother. And but no, this is this is for like a good reason. And it, to me, it was kind of like. Like money can also be this burden that you need for you know for for normal everyday reasons, right? In this case, it's a bit more dramatic because it's like literally someone's well being. But yeah. like it it became this like burden of just something. Whereas money and a lot of the other you know context we've seen it in so far, it's it's always it's it's related directly to the power. It's related directly to the feeling like you have accomplished things. Yeah, it's very much personal gain. Yeah, whereas here, it never feels like that. You know, when he goes to his trunk and pulls out the money, it's more just like, no, this is the purpose of the money. That was always for something like this. He was never yeah. accumulating it for for uh, ego or Which for, you know. Is, is in contrast to, you know, what I was talking about with Martin in the first episode, in that he clearly has a reasonable amount of money already, mm -hmm. but there is absolutely no signs of that in his apartment. Well, how much, how much did he spend on that flag? Like, no, that flag cost a lot of money. <laughs> Stop going on about the flag. It was red and white diamonds, then blue diamonds, and the, the little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. It's all, it's all rubies and sapphires. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a very ostentatious By the way, flag. I, I might have read, uh, not so much a spoiler for the show, but I might have read a spoiler in the sense that I had read an actor who, who was going to pop up on the show at some point. This is going to excite me. And it's not an actor, though. So it's someone who pops up on the show, but they're not—they're not actually an actor traditionally. Are they playing themselves, or are they actually? Oh, I have no or... idea. I have no idea if they are. Do I want to know who this is? Because I feel like I might. You might smile when you hear. <laughs> do you want to tell me after, or do you want to tell me on? Uh, like, I don't know if we want to spoil it for other. That's people. A, that's a good point. I don't know if people. I, I don't expect all the audience would care. Some might though, but people are probably ahead of us at this point. I would—I would think. Mostly. Joe, I'll do right at the very end of the show. I'll do it, so you can you can stop watching. And, I, and people okay. who want the reaction on camera from Connor, they'll still get that at the end. Okay, I'm excited. Right, I just I saw an offhand comment, and it's not a spoiler because it's not a plot thing. It's just this person shows up. I feel like no matter who this is now, I'm going to be somewhat disappointed. I don't think you will be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, it's perfect. Okay. Okay, it's not I'll as perfect. Away. It's not as perfect as David Lynch in metal. David Lynch would be the perfect, perfect. But <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, what was I talking about? Oh yes, money, oh, power. I, I feel like I already know who this is, and it was in a. He was in a trailer. Oh, was he? Yeah. Okay. It's, it, is it related to video games? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was in a trailer. Let, let's just say uh, Refid and someone else might have done a wee swapsy for some projects coming this year. <laughs> They're quite good friends, I gather. <laughs> Apart, I seem so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you don't, you, you, I don't need to do the ending thing now. And for anyone who, anyone who knows who this is, has probably gone it from what we just said, admittedly. So <laughs> apologies yeah. if that's a. And if, if you don't know who that is, you've got a nice surprise coming mm. up. Assuming you care. <laughs> Assuming you care, yeah. Otherwise, it'll just be some random dude you don't care about. Yeah. Um, anyway. So, uh, power, money, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, yeah, I just think it's interesting that the money in this episode is, is a very different vibe. It feels like this necessary evil as opposed to something that's there for gain. And it kind of makes money on its own is not the evil entity as it stands. It's people that make it good or bad, it's right? It's the, the usage of such yeah. money, yeah. Yeah, it's the, the desire for it and whatever. Uh, so that's really interesting. And again, all the other themes that are at play here, um, you know, the treatment of, of, of women at play once again. Um, you know, I, I think we have to sort of rewind here. I, I need to talk, we need to talk about Janie getting drunk in a bar, which very noticeably, we never see the bartender in this scene. I thought it was going to be like a reveal at the end of the scene. And it was just, no, it's just super, like the depth of field is so shallow. And it's yeah. just, we see Janie in focus, but never the bartender. And it's kind of this weird thing where eventually the bartender just gives her another drink, even though... She's not got ID on her. Well, she does, but it's not. She age. does because at first she tries claiming she's like twenty two or whatever, and the bartender's like, yeah, "Sure, you are." You know, <laughs> and, and it goes on for a while, and she eventually goes, "Fine, look, here's my ID. I'm seventeen. Damn it." I think before this scene, we didn't know what Jenna Malone's actual day to day job was yet, and I thought it was going to reveal it was her because we hadn't seen her like. Okay. You know, I don't, I don't think it was until uh, Martin goes to see her that we see that oh, she's actually got like an actual job and. Do we not see her with the couple? 
It's, we see them at the start, but that's when she's like a new agey person. Yeah, but I mean, new agey therapy is kind of a job. Oh, I never assumed that was her like day to day job, though. Given that this is what's leading to hit men. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, like I, I well, it wasn't so much that I I was like sure that she had another job, but she ended up do did having, but. Um, well, I mean, she's a counsellor, but I feel like the hippie stuff is kind of an extension of that as opposed to actually what she does at the job. I, f- I mean, fair enough. Because I... it, cause it sounds like she she like gets, like, she obviously she meets a lot of people as a counsellor, and then, like, some of them she, like, takes further on to the like, she recommends maybe her extracurricular version, <laughs> which is... Yeah I, yeah, I don't disagree with that. I think <sighs> she's always relatively hippie. Uh, you know, and and you know, new agey. Oh yeah, but uh, in the opening scene, she's in like this like really like soft room with weird like art all around her. It, whereas in the, in the office job, she's at a desk like a normal person. <laughs> that could be just a reception room. <laughs> Shut a meeting up. room. I, Stop I mean, fighting me on no. this. I I oh I I tend to agree. I think the other one is an extension of her job, but I still think it is part of her day but job. Anyway, I think maybe, maybe she uses it for the the. Uh, the special clients, shall when, we say. When they were hiding the bartender's identity, I thought that it might like eventually focus it would be her. It was like, oh, she also right. works at this bar and so she's or she's intentionally talking to Jenny or something. I don't know. I never did. It was just Yeah. You know. you, you're trying to predict anything and everything. Yeah, well but she eventually gives her a drink anyway, even though just, just because of like basically realizing she needs a drink is essentially how it's sum it up as. Yeah. Um but Jenny, she goes to this. It's this like uh, memorial. Her mother was the, the, you know, was an artist, and uh, you know, Daddy Baldwin, who, by the way, really because he wasn't doing the sniffing thing, he actually sounded like exactly like Alec Baldwin, like throughout the entirety of this scene. And I was like, man, you can tell these two are only because he sounds exactly like him. Yeah, you could you could hear it in the first episode, you know, through the sniffling. It wasn't um, as clear though because he was constantly. No, it was that interrupted the flow of it. But yeah. Yeah, I think you could tell. Um, but what I was noticing, because because uh, Maren's already sitting there really awkwardly waiting for her, and she comes up and sits with him. And what I was, what was sticking out to me in this scene is just kind of the, the art that was up around them in the background. Like some of it was very like playing into the themes of the show in a big way. There was one that was like a big muscly guy, and then the woman was like sort of down on her knees, and it was kind of it was kind of like like the slave girl was down there, and like the big guy was in charge, and then but then yeah. there was another one where two women in like who were topless had machine guns and masks on, and it was like. This is the revenge fantasy. Yeah, like like, it, like all, the patents were all kind of speaking to me in terms of the themes of the show, mm. which I, I I thought was interesting. Um, so that ah, you know, I just wanted to point that out more than anything. Uh, yeah, Baldwin goes on for like ages about showing off the art. Yeah, to honor his wife. you're gonna take it. You know this this gallery or go around the you know around the world, the plant into London next, and then you know into mainland Europe. Hmm. Uh, it's going to be a big show of this, uh, you know, all these, all, all these paintings, and, and you know. But once it moves on uh, for the for the actual, you know, the gallery, the the building itself is still being used, and it'll be to promote, uh, you know, pr- pr- projects uh, by women, right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's what he said. And I think what's interesting here is it kind of adds in this smaller theme. Uh, of paintings, as weird as that sounds, because last episode had the the big painting that they're all kind of worshiping with the. And again, it's a dead person. We're talking about a dead. You know, and yeah, this... I think even uh, the the first shot of the the show, you know, the uh, the the desert shot. Oh yeah, it was a mural on the wall. Yeah, the mural. Yeah. Uh, the idea of like I don't know commemorating like things gone by, and that you know the episode one was a Wild West, which we said obviously plays into kind of what all the characters are involved in. And that's, this is two episodes in a row where last episode it was the portrait of someone who's died that they're kind of worshipping. In this episode it's the art of someone who died and they're remembering her that way. Uh, I, I think remembering the deads and maybe another thing that's kind of creeping in to this because we have like, this dead character, like, in, in both cases a mother and both yes. sides that, that's kind of played into it. Uh, and even even uh, Vigo's mother is like, you know, old and sick and he's dying like you know we've got again death i mean honestly saying life and death that are female theme are really like easy because they're always like the themes like life and death are just applicable to almost everything you, you could throw that into like 95 percent of art house media but i, I feel like right i feel like here specifically death is kind of creeping in more as, as we no i agree and, the and it's the the concept of you know like the the death of how you know how Martin's treating death and have, is very cold and unfeeling about it mm-hmm. versus these people uh, having these memorials. You know, even going back to the, the first episode, you know, when Larry's uh, killed, 
and the shock of that at first, and then by the end of it, that memorial service, Martin, Martin's barely even aware that it's happening. He's barely even caring about going to it. And then Wait, you oppose that to here, and you have this memorial service. Which you know, not, notably, uh, the characters in the last episode, uh, the family, were very much about respecting the dead and respecting the memories and the portrait and traditions until the dawn died. And Miguel and, uh, obviously, Gato was his right-hand man. Yeah, it is. Yeah. All of a sudden they in power is kind of like martin where all of a sudden it's unfeeling where it's like no now now we don't care about death we don't care about honoring yeah. the past because uh you know, obviously going back to last of them shooting all the cops at the end was so cold and you know it it was very much like like martin taking on the hit here just yeah it's just a matter of fact yeah i i, I think it's interesting like because if, at least from Martin's perspective, it doesn't seem like he wants to change the system, which is why Martin may end up going down more of a path of ego, where he ends up kind of becoming a third party that's not connected to either side. Quite possibly, yeah. Um, but but very interesting. But there's a lot of things to play. I, I think, you know, people people who don't like this show will just hate how long the, the shots are and how much how long it takes to get to things. But if you like the obviously the, the pace and the tone and the mood, you, you'll love that stuff uh, as we do. Uh, I, I think what this show has been really good at so far, though, is I feel, feel like each episode has introduced characters and themes and really made them kind of complement each other. Where you know, after episode one, you know, I, you know, after episode one, I said these are the three core themes of the show. Episode two added all onto all three of them in a way that was different because of the context. And in this episode, it's kind of twisting them a little bit and saying, "Here's a character who's completely yeah. different from these other characters." And I think it's worth noting that, that is essential in a TV show like this because. Yeah, sure, the show can look pretty and gorgeous and we can just enjoy it for that. But that's very surface level. And, you know, for 12 and a half hours, sure, it's probably still enjoyable, but it's not It's it's not got the weight to it. Whereas, no, this here, you know, you've got some something to analyze, something to dig into. You've got all these deeper meaning things here, the themes to play with. Uh, that's what, you know, actually keeps you engaged over, over the course of the show. Yeah, but I feel like... I feel like the way you said that was really weird there because it, that's not the only thing that can make it work as a TV show. <laughs> there's, there's, no, no. Because it's, like, yeah. it's not like when we were watching, I don't know, Stranger Things, we're like, oh, it's so deep and there's all these themes. Like, No, 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 no but that's like, playing on, on a completely different thing. And in a show like this, of this style, sure. this sort of pacing, the yeah. pacing alone and you know the, the cinematography is not enough. Um, it's not got enough, like, oh, you know, exciting action things or... Uh, you know, all, all the things, you know, like you're talking about Stranger Things, it's got action and all that sort of stuff going on. You've got all the witty banter between the characters. This show doesn't have any of that. It's not doing any of those things. Hey, hey, hold on now. Tomorrow I have to follow a one-eyed man. <laughs> all right, it's got one amazing line. <laughs> <laughs> I will grant you that one. Which is, but with further record, it's not a million miles away from a one-armed man. I just want to point that out there. Oh, if, oh. We're, if we're making Twin Peaks comparisons, that's not a million it's, miles away uh, from that. It's not there. Yeah. <laughs> but on the, that idea there, what I was saying is, I think having the, the deeper meaning is actually what gives it the longevity beyond just being something really nice to look at for a couple hours. Oh, sure, yeah. I, it's, um... I'm impressed, and it's not like I wasn't expecting to be impressed. Um, I think it's it's definitely more slower paced than Reffin's actual movies because it's it's got so much more time to dole out its its points and its yeah. its, its beats. But obviously, there's still going to be more, and I I think the the reason why I'm complimenting that is that you're saying okay, it has to have these things to make it an engaging TV show, and you're right to a point. But I think what I'm saying I'm specifically impressed by is that it's completely shook what it was previously for, with each episode that's passed like mm -hmm. episode two introduced so much and episode three interest each episode has enriched the themes like it, it could be compelling and just sort of stick to the themes that it started out with in episode one and still have depth but it's actually adding layers to those themes with each episode so far oh, i agree yeah. Um, yeah absolutely and i think that's what's impressive to me from a writing standpoint and, and maybe that's just some rubaker influence maybe that's just just reffing being reffing but yeah um, no, because I'm, I'm glad these elements are here that are shaking it up. Because I mean, uh, I've you know been excited for this show for you know pretty much since it was announced. We both have, but I've been on the record of being cautious that can can reference style hold up over a TV show versus just you know a two hour movie. Mm. And I think so far the way it is changing and, and evolving um, is is telling me yes, yes it can. He can adapt to that. And maybe that is Brubaker helping along. Or oh. maybe maybe he just knows what he's doing. What's also interesting to me is that is the time jump between episodes and the idea that 
you know, we ended, like, Refn wasn't afraid to, like, stick around or, like, you know, because I almost feel like the natural thing to do if you were following, like, a, and I feel, like, this is so weird, this sounds like I'm, I'm, I'm uh, dissing on Breaking Bad, and I am not, I freaking love Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Those are, those are, they, they, I mean, they, they may Incredibly arguably, decompressed. they are arguably, in, at the end of this show, I might say this, still better than this show. Like, I don't know if I'm going to say this show is better than those. I, I don't, I, that's, because that is a lofty thing for anything to try and be, is better than it those is, two yeah. shows. But those shows, like, th- you know, they, they thrive on doing everything methodically through the process of the character's journey, right? Whereas this show has been happy in three episodes to ignore characters for a whole episode and then jump so that, you know, episode one ended with Martin just kind of accepting his new life. But instead of getting, like, his first big job with the, the mob, he just can, we skipped ahead to when he's starting to feel, like, like, worn out by it almost. Or Even, like, you know, the, the last time we saw him with, with Janie, she was walking off, you know, he'd left her in the street and was like, oh, I never want to see you again. Well, he had text her at the end, though, to be fair. Well, sure, he texted her, but that was it, right? It was it was the start of building back up to it. Whereas here, it, it it's almost routine, you know, it's, everything's normal. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, we, we, we didn't see any of that, you know, okay, well, you know, let, let, let's soil out, forgive each other. There's none of that, you know, conversation to be had, which I'm sure they did have. Yeah, there's just a lot of natural things in the gap that you can assume happen. You don't have to yeah. spell it all out. Yeah, right. Um, which is fine because you, you, through context, it's very clear that these things have happened. Yeah, and I, th- I think the one scene that we have to mention as well uh, that we've not talked about yet, and one that I think is maybe what piques Martin's interest in Vigo in a big way, is when he actually goes to see the family. You know, he sees the couple from the start of the episode, and he meets their son um because when we find we find out that it was the son that was assaulted in the police station you know when he's talking to the lieutenant yeah. he's, he's dishing out the details and the son comes in the room and he's got crutches because because we find out uh uh he he was a, he was a carer for for people with disabilities and he took advantage of someone he was caring for that that was kind of his his thing and he he, he had lots of victims that he had like 10 victims or something like that uh, to yeah. that effect and you know it's so super dark and he comes in and you know he says hey to him and he asks, you know, can you give me your mum like a minute? And the mum says, no, 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 you can speak in front of him. And, you know, he shows a photo of the, you know, of Vigo uh, from his FBI. Because he like, he's not got a beard, he's clean shaved, and this is like from his FBI yeah, days. Yeah. Ask, ask him if he knows him. He just says, no, who is he? Uh, and he just says, no, yeah, nobody. Yeah, but, he's, it, but he does confirm, you know, uh, you're, 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 I can't remember the guy's name, <laughs> the culprit, the, your, your attacker. He was, he was killed. And the kid's like, good (laughs) like i'm glad Uh, and it's kind of emotional for him and i I think this may be the scene that kind of because because up until this point he's not been searching for for vigo yet i think this is the scene that kind of definitively puts him on a path where he's not immediately going to arrest him like the like now it's more fascinating to him like he wants to dig deep into this okay i'm with you so when he sees the reaction and and sees it's actually brought them some sort of comfort comfort yeah yeah um, or maybe clo- beyond just... closures are maybe a better word but yeah sure beyond, beyond just you know what, what could have happened uh it, he kind of feels like okay no he he kind of respects what vigo did all of a sudden rather than it just feeling like a random hit job yeah um it felt like it had purpose which I, I again i think ties into later on when he's given the job and he's like oh why am i killing this person you know what did you do yeah uh, he, he wants some purpose and, and wants to know what he's doing yeah um so no it's fascinating so i'm sure we'll talk a lot more about the characters uh in episode four which we'll hopefully have up the day after tomorrow that that's the that's the goal right now mm-hmm. now admittedly once dark starts up in netflix um we'll try and keep I the schedule scramble to try and get it all out yeah as best we can uh, but if it ends up being a, a couple of extra days between episodes just bear with us and we'll we'll definitely be sticking to it and, and getting out uh so but that has been episode four so let us know what you thought of the episode in the comments below you can like and subscribe all the usual stuff uh get us on the twitters at mail underscore fuzz for channel updates uh, if you would like to support the channel and the show and everything we do here you can head over to patreon.com slash mail tv where you can support us for as little as one dollar per month and that keeps the reviews coming uh it helps get to new goals and a lot more content for everyone but it also gets you exclusive stuff and some stuff early for being being on the patreon um so you can go do that uh you can also of course um check out our other content you can check out other stuff we're working on we mentioned dark season 2 coming up uh this week in fact by the time this goes up it's probably going to be like a day or two away from dark season 2 hitting yeah 
Friday for anyone who, yeah. who's not sure when this is now. So so check that out um, for sure. If you've not checked out season one on Netflix, um, check out our reviews of uh, Big Little Lies and our reviews of Handmaid's Tale and our reviews of a bunch of other stuff. Um, if you're a lot of good TV right now, there is. Um, and if you you know if you're interested in the audio feeds, if you're on the audio feed for this, there's two TV review audio feeds for new TV shows. Um, there's uh, almost cancelled TV reviews, which is everything but netflix and then there's the almost cancelled netflix reviews which is all the netflix originals uh yeah, so which, which should tell you just how much netflix stuff we end up covering. i know because there's a lot of it hey maybe one day there'll be an amazon feed for amazon prime content it may get there someday hey i'd love that to be because every so often they pump <clears throat> out a gem here's the thing though here's the thing with apple and disney start starting their services and then warner media announcing originals like do we have like a feed for every like original content thing I don't know. That feels a bit excessive. It does, doesn't it? Like Netflix has become enough of just a household staple that most people and, have. And, that... and specifically for us, Netflix reviews get the most traffic. We have an, enough people who just check out Netflix reviews no matter what that it's worth doing the, the specific. Yeah, feed. It, it doesn't matter what it is. Oh, is this is the new Netflix show. I'm so, I'm somewhat interested. Um, I, I'm not sure Warner will have that same response. Apple. And maybe the only one who could have that same response. At least not at first. I could see it being a thing eventually. Yeah. Uh, any of them could build it up, and I, it's something like Lord of the Rings on Amazon, or something like Disney with. Well, Disney's a weird one because I feel like okay, the Star Wars and the Marvel stuff might do really well. I don't know if just Disney blanket originals will have that same. No, I think their branded franchise things will do very well. Yeah. Uh, the other stuff people might check out just because. Well, hey, I've already got the service, but. Yeah. <laughs> Warner Media have got a Dune TV show coming. They're they're, they're banking hey, on. I'm kind of excited for that. They're banking on Villeneuve, 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 Villevong. I don't know. Villeneuve, I believe. Villeneuve, Denis Villeneuve. Uh, but yeah. So anyway, that's us. Thank you very much once again for watching or listening. We always appreciate it. Keep watching TV, guys. Have you got any vanilla? <laughs>